On the 7th of October, 2016, WikiLeaks published John Podesta's emails, 50,000 of them. This is significant because John Podesta wasn't just the chair for Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign, but also special advisor to President Obama. And that's not all. Podesta was also chief of staff to President Bill Clinton in the 90s. You see, where presidents rise and fall and come and go, Podesta had held the highest offices in the White House in the 90s, into the 2000s, and even in the 2010s. And now he was preparing to sail into another two-term administration, this time with President Hillary Clinton. So when these emails leaked, it was massive, like preposterously big. Suddenly, anyone who wanted to could go online and search through WikiLeaks for whatever they wanted. If you had a bone to pick with the powers that be, if you wanted to find instances of collusion, conspiracy, and corruption, you could now literally search through the conversations that have been going on behind closed doors at the heart of government, and it was as easy as a Google search. Do you want to know about Hillary Clinton's real relationship with Wall Street? Do you want to see who the Clintons shortlisted as potential VPs? Do you want to see pay for play within the Clinton Foundation? And do you want to see a rock star trying to get Podesta's ear to discuss UFOs? Yeah, for real. WikiLeaks might be remembered for losing Hillary the presidency. It might be remembered for Julian Assange and how relentlessly the defense and intelligence community has pursued him ever since. It might be remembered for the vast amount of corruption that it exposed at the heart of government. But of all the email chains, none of them seem that big when compared to the story of a rock star charming his way into the Obama White House and the Clinton presidential campaign, all off the back of an almost unbelievable story about UFOs. This is the story about the Clintons' fascination with extraterrestrial life. This is the story about John Podesta's secret plan to win over the trust of the youth. And perhaps most astonishingly, this is the story of how Tom DeLonge finally got the world to take UFOs seriously. Stay tuned. This is a big one. Hi, my name's Jason Samosa and welcome to Jason Samosa's Ufology Moment. How are you getting on? Are you well? I haven't seen you for a while. Where have you been? It's kind of hard to track you down these days. Hard to pin you down. A lot in the diary, huh? I'm well, thanks. Cheers. Look, the Tom DeLonge story is one of the most fascinating stories in ufology. You know, like in religions, you have these important historical events, the Garden of Eden, God's promise to Abraham, the Exodus. When it comes to ufology, when it comes to the history of this subject, there are certain historical moments that count more than others. And I would say that this whole Tom DeLonge story and everything that happened before, within it, and around it constitutes one of the most fascinating and important historical moments in the history of ufology. And even if you're watching this and you're thinking, you know what, I don't believe in this stuff, in some ways this story is perfect. Because ultimately, by the end of this story, you have irrefutable proof, not that UFOs exist, not that they represent non-human intelligence, but irrefutable proof that people very high up in the Department of Defense, in the Air Force, and in large aerospace companies are preoccupied with this issue that they are interested in these things in the skies and that they seem to have some interest in talking about it. And I'm talking about people so senior that it will shock you. But before we can get to that, before we can get to all the fascinating, shocking, strange and bizarre, before all of that, we have to start somewhere. And that starting point is Tom DeLonge in the year 2015. If you were a Blink-182 fan in 2015, it was a bad year. The band broke up around January time. They'd only just got back together like a few years earlier and they'd released one album, which I think most people would say was pretty average. And then they'd broken up again and it was off the back of Tom DeLonge, who for some reason wanted to break away from what was at that time one of the biggest bands in the world to do something. And there was this big kerfuffle and the press and the media were all inflaming it in that moment if you were in that bubble and you were receiving that news. It was sad, but that was just the beginning of a whole series of events involving Tom. 
From there, he started doing interviews and talking more and more openly about his passion around the subject of UFOs and the idea that there might be something else quite mysterious out there. Now look, you know, there's nothing worse than when a comedian tries to be a politician or when a rock star tries to become an expert on life out there in the universe. And especially if you're Tom DeLonge and you're this guy who's been the front of not just a pop punk rebellious band that's kind of associated with silliness, especially when it's an area as controversial as UFOs. We forget this. You know, now it's 2023 and you have NASA saying things like, UAP are one of our planet's greatest mysteries. Believe that understanding UAP is vital. We don't know what these UAP are. That's the message that's coming from the United States government in 2023. Go back eight years ago. If you were to say that as a normal citizen, people would laugh at you. And so here's Tom DeLonge this rock star who's associated with, you know, like fart jokes and like stupidness and party culture. And he's coming out and he's saying, I believe in this stuff and I've got all these theories about it. And 99% of people just thought he was kind of crazy. Now, as that year progressed, Tom started to do more and more interviews. And in those interviews, he wasn't just saying that he believed in this stuff. He started to claim that he was in touch with people deep, within the Department of Defense. He was basically saying, not only is this stuff real, but I found the people who've been covering it up. I found them. Not only this, but he also said that he'd been warned by people to be really careful because he was getting too close to the truth. I want you to imagine that a really good friend of yours is speaking like this. What would you think? You would think, dude, are you okay? You know what it's like, right? When someone gets really enthused and passionate and there is a certain tone in their voice, they believe it with such conviction and they're deeply frustrated and passionate at the same time. I'm sure you've heard somebody speaking in that way before. And you know what? Perhaps the best way to give you a sense of just how crazy Tom sounded at that time is just to give you a snippet of some interviews from the period. Here is Tom DeLong, circa 2015, early 2016. Then there's this damn one issue of UFOs, right? <laughs> Where I've been studying it for so long. So I was able to pull off a coup in regards to what anybody in this field has ever been able to pull off. I am not naive, not, not naive to this subject. It, it doesn't matter. I'm dealing with some very important people and these things are just starting to happen one after another, one after another. I've been told four different times to be very careful. So I, I, w I went to them with a thesis. There's a lot of things that I can't talk about. People have to try Trust me on this. And so I'm sitting here telling these guys this. I'm going, something smells fishy to me. Really fishy. Right at that point when I said that is when I got a communication that came through that says, meet next to the Pentagon on this date and this time. I'm telling you, it's, dude, my life has been like unreal for the past year. But just know that there's something that can happen with young adult people everywhere to realize and put down their weapons. So right when I said that is when I got some very, 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 very serious look. I said, we're going to introduce you to some people. And that's how I got in because I hit the nail on the head. And guess what? They know this. I can't describe these people. I'm not allowed to. Someone sat down across the table from me and I had to do some really hardcore explaining. The person pounds on the table and says, this is the story of the millennia. That's exactly how I felt my entire life. You want to know why I got brought into the most secret groups ever? Is because I went in there and I said, you know, something's wrong here. Let me tell you the way I see it. And they said, okay. Really intense, right? Like, really intense. And remember, we've got to keep remembering, this was 2016. The world was fundamentally different. There was no Trump, there was no Brexit, there was no Ukraine war, people weren't talking about World War III, and people definitely were not talking openly about the idea that these unidentified aerial phenomena were something to be taken seriously. And here is Tom speaking like this. So look, I'm sure you know a lot of crazy people who say a lot of really crazy stuff. Just go down to your local pub, go to Glastonbury Festival, just go to the places where these people tend to hang out and speak really passionately about stuff and you can experience this. So why have I brought this up? Why are we telling this story? Well, look, here's the thing. As crazy and unhinged as Tom DeLonge sounds in those interview segments, the evidence really genuinely does point towards him actually being in contact with someone. Now, how can I say that? How can I say that with any legitimacy? 
Do you remember WikiLeaks? Hillary Clinton was taking the weekend to prepare for the final debate this Wednesday, but as she stepped out of the spotlight, WikiLeaks. The surrogate for the Russian government. By WikiLeaks, I've seen emails. WikiLeaks. Wall Street speeches. WikiLeaks. Podesta's email. From WikiLeaks. Connections to Russia. WikiLeaks. The Podesta emails. Hacked emails. The WikiLeaks released 10,000 emails. Cover up 12,000 emails. That email exchange. The WikiLeaks. 50,000 emails. Emails. Email at WikiLeaks. The Russians. WikiLeaks. Russian government. Cover up for damaging emails. WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks of the Russian government. It speeches to Wall Street. Stolen emails. More than 1,100 new emails. From WikiLeaks. Prepare to cover up. They have hacked a thousands more emails. Released by WikiLeaks. Russia's involvement. Yes. Private email server. John Podesta. They reveal hacked emails. Espionage against Americans. You may remember the 2016 presidential campaign. <laughs> I mean, I do. And I live here in the United Kingdom. It was unreal. It was fascinating. It was like one of the greatest dramas of all time. And in the throws and the swings and the struggle to try and win that election, Hillary and Donald were both throwing major punches. At one point around October 2016, someone leaked that famous audio of Donald Trump talking about women in a really bad way. And literally within hours, the WikiLeaks emails were released. In the context of the 2016 election, those emails were enormous. They literally filled the headlines and the psychological real estate of the media class for months. It damaged Hillary Clinton in a way that was irreparable. It literally soured her reputation. People always had their skepticism about Hillary. People always knew that she was fundamentally a political bureaucrat who was a pragmatist, who would say one thing in public, but probably said different things behind closed doors. But when those emails came out, you no longer had to do guesswork. You could see that out in the open to see it was a reality. That was the headline from the WikiLeaks emails being published. Hillary is corrupt. Hillary is making promises to Wall Street and all this kind of stuff. But here's what's fascinating. Over time, people dug deeper and deeper into this vast number of emails and they found stuff, fascinating stuff, stuff that I can't even talk about on this channel because it's so dark and strange and confusing. But if you know, you know. But most importantly, and relevant to our conversation here, are 35 emails, some from Tom DeLong to John Podesta, some from Tom DeLong to John Podesta's staff, some from Podesta's staff back to Tom, and also involving a wider cast of characters. And they're all talking about one thing, UFOs. Now look, is there anything crazy about this? Is this truly surprising? I mean, let's just take an example, right? Right now, I could write an email to Joe Biden. I'm sure I could find a personal email address for one of his staffers if I persisted for long enough. And I could write 35 emails talking about UFOs and we could see what happens and maybe I'll make a documentary about that, huh? How would you like that? I'm sure you wouldn't. You wouldn't like that. So just watch yourself. Watch yourself. Otherwise, I, you know, because I am running out of ideas, actually. So maybe I'll end up doing that. Sorry, I got ready to cross there. But here's the thing. Firstly, the emails imply that Tom and John have already spoken about this issue. And there are replies from Podesta staff back to Tom talking about arranging things and related to this issue. And there are messages from Podesta staff to other people in Podesta staff talking about a UFO project. Not only this, but during the dialogue, Tom says to Podesta, I've got two really important people of the highest caliber related to our sensitive subject that ran the most fragile divisions associated with it. Look, you don't have to read between the lines. If you're talking about UFOs, clearly he's trying to hint within the context of this email that he's made connections with these people, very similar to what he was claiming in those podcast interviews. But again, you know, for the skeptics out there, you might say, well, look, this is all talk. But here's what happened next. In the context of that email chain, there is a meeting scheduled. And when you read the emails, it seems pretty clear that that meeting did happen. And because we have the metadata for the emails, we can see who was invited. Firstly, there's Tom DeLong. Then there's John Podesta. That's already interesting enough. But then there are three additional attendees. And it's possible, piecing small bits of detail together to pretty easily work out who these three men are. And when I tell you exactly who they were, at the very least, your eyebrows will go up. At the very least. So what is this already about? Well, look, the best way to tell that story is actually just to let Tom tell his. How is it this rock star guy gains access to this when so many people, senators and, and researchers and scientists and spooks who've tried to look for this stuff couldn't find it? How do you get the access? Why, how do you explain that? Well, I might as well just tell you the story. Um, I had an opportunity. The most 
classified and the most advanced group of engineers and scientists that work within the military industrial complex work under one one specific group. But for the very first time, they were doing an event where family members can come and not go in the buildings, but at least celebrate in the parking lot what their loved ones do during the day. You know, so I knew this one individual, and he said, "Do you want to come and introduce the head, the head, the head, the head of the company?" Okay, let's just stop here for a second. Sorry, I know we've only just got started, but this is actually a perfect moment to investigate the first person who is invited into this special meeting that Tom DeLong and John Podesta had with these mysterious people. So the first name that we're going to look at is somebody called Robert Weiss. Well, luckily, we have his email address. And in that email address, he's not just using a Gmail or a Yahoo or something like this, but he's actually got his company domain attached to it. So if you type in lmco.com, what do you get? Well, it's a pretty famous aerospace company called Lockheed Martin. So large aerospace company associated with advanced aircraft. That's pretty interesting. But let's go a step further. Let's take Robert Weiss and type that in with Lockheed Martin and see what we get. All it takes is a Google search and you can see that there is somebody called Robert Weiss, not only an executive vice president at Lockheed Martin, but also the president of the Skunk Works. So what are these companies and, and why might they be relevant? Well, for those of you who don't know, Lockheed Martin is the world's biggest military aviation and aerospace company. To put some figures to that, the annual defense budget in the United States is a preposterously big $800 billion. So how much do you think Lockheed Martin gets out of that budget? If I told you it was $50 billion, would you believe me? One sixteenth of the entire military budget goes to one company. Now, within Lockheed Martin, which is an organization which has over 100,000 employees worldwide, there is a subdivision called the Skunk Works. And this is where the most advanced tip of the spear research goes on. When there's an amazing aircraft made of the Skunk Works, when there's a stealth fighter or, you know, an F-117 Nighthawk or whatever these aircraft are, we won't hear about it for 10, 20, 30 years later, unless there's some sort of accident. To quote former Skunk Works CEO Ben Rich, we already have the means to travel among the stars but these technologies are locked up in black projects and it would take an act of God to ever get them out to the benefit of humanity. So you can imagine that if someone is the president of the Skunk Works, that they might be relevant to the subject of UFOs, not least because they're going to be the people who understand exactly what's possible in the United States inventory. If you could get on the phone, if you could meet with the president of the Skunk Works, you're probably speaking with one of the most important people to try and work out what the truth is about stuff in the skies, not just about what we've created in our deep black inventory, but also about what might well lie outside of it. So anyway, with all of that aside, when Tom says that he's meeting with this group of people who represent this really advanced group of engineers and he managed to get an opportunity to speak with the head of the company and then you see Robert Weiss's name in the email chain with a domain for Lockheed Martin, well, I think you can piece those two things together. Again, it's not definitive proof, but it looks like Tom is referring to an event that occurred that led him to have this connection with this person. Anyway, back to Tom. He goes, hey, look, this is, this is a way for you to come up and, and see a little bit about what we're doing. And I said, oh, my God, I, I would love to. And he said, do you want to come and introduce uh, the head of the company? Then I said, I will if I get to sit with him for five minutes, because I knew exactly who these uh, engineers were. I um, just said, hey, I have an idea for a project, and this project will reverse the cynicism that people have about government. And I said, can I come up in a couple weeks and tell you more about it? Absolutely. So a couple weeks go by, then I come back up, and so I walk in, and they're sitting there. I, I had no plan for even bringing up UFOs then either. I was smarter than that. So we're talking, and one person did a bunch of research on me. So halfway through the conversation, this person says, so so what about all the conspiracy stuff that you're into? I tried to talk my way out of it, and then in comes the head of the company. I, I said, you know, you come in at a very interesting part of the conversation. Uh, this person brought up, you know, the whole UFO issue with me. I just want you to know that uh, I don't plan on, you know, treating that disrespectfully with this project. And the head guy says, we cannot be involved with anything to do with that subject, especially since there has been absolutely no evidence whatsoever that it exists. I said, sir, can I speak to you for five minutes alone? And he goes, sure. And I just go, this is exactly what I said. I want you to understand something. I understand the national security implications about about what I'm about to say. Um, I am not naive to the, to the topic. I think if you hear 
me out, you're going to see that there's merit in what I'm about to propose. And he goes, well, what topic are you talking about? I go, UFO, sir. And so then I just laid out this entire Secret Machines project. And I said, if you allow me to do this, what I'm trying to do, that I'm going to ask you for some help. I need advisors. I need people to help guide me so I don't keep disinforming people. So I said, I'm going to send you something. I want you to read it. And please, if you find anything about it good, just respond any way you can. He goes, okay. All right. So next point that we've got to cover. What is this Secret Machines project that Tom is talking about? If you go back and listen to the early interviews with Tom, even in 2011 and 2014, he had certain conversations. He talked about this idea of creating a project which could help communicate to the youth something about the truth of UFOs, because Tom's always been fascinated in this subject. So in early interviews, you can hear him starting to express this idea and toy with it. But by the 2016 period, this idea had reached a level of maturity. Now, there's all sorts of bits and pieces associated with this plan that he had. But by far the most ingenious part, is this. Tom's idea was to create fiction and non-fiction books on the UFO topic and then using his celebrity find people within the defense and intelligence community, within the aerospace community, within the Pentagon and say to them, look, I'm not here to be rude to you. I'm not here to say that you're hiding something. I'm just here to show you my book and to ask if you have any advice or pointers if I'm in the right direction or the wrong direction, you know, share your ideas and I will never reveal who you are. That was his idea. And actually, if you think about it, it's absolutely ingenious because if this stuff is really going on, just work with me here for a second. Imagine that UFOs are real, that there is something out there, and that there has been an attempt to cover it up for whatever reason. I'm not here to explain what that is. We don't have to cover it. But imagine if that's going on and there are people actually responsible for this issue. Can you imagine some of the things they might have learned by this point? Maybe they have made contact. Maybe they have worked out that there's something out there. Again, let's just say that it's real. If those people did exist, surely they would be absolutely dying to share some of the fascinating, bizarre, and even worrying things that they've learned. And so what better way to help them get that out than giving them a layer of plausible deniability? Tom DeLong comes along and he sounds kind of crazy and he's talking about all this stuff and he writes these books and he's saying, I have these advisors in the background who are helping me to write this stuff, but those advisors are never revealed to the public, or at least they shouldn't be. So that's what he's talking about when he says there's this secret machines project that he lays out for the person who I think we can reasonably assume to be Robert Weiss in this meeting. Back to Tom. And then, then the meeting was done. So what I did was the nonfiction books that we've been working on right next to the secret machines novel in, in parallel has, it's a, it's a thesis of the UFO phenomenon. So I took the prologue to that thesis and I sent it to him. Well, two weeks later, I get this email and it says, I want you to be next to the Pentagon at this date and this time you're going to be meeting somebody from the CIA. And so I, I was like, oh my God, oh my God, it's, it's working. So I get on a plane and I fly out to DC. I had to go to a very specific location that was within a rock's throw of the Pentagon. And I go to the back of a room and there's two guys in suits waiting at a table for me. Uh, the person I was talking to is one of the persons. And he goes, I think this would be a good time for you to tell this person what you told me. The, so I talked for about 20 some minutes because they were just eyeballing me like hot. At this point, I, I just don't know. I've never been in these situations before. So I didn't know if I was saying the wrong thing or not, but I was just trying to be very respectful and I went through with it. And I finished my speech and the person is just staring at me. I mean, these squinting eyes, you know, his beard, the suit, uh, takes a breath and goes, things like this don't happen at the White House. They don't happen at the Hill. They happen in places like this, at tables like this, where a few men get together and decide to push the ball down the field. And then the meeting was done. I mean, done, like a movie done. So the very next day, I got sent over to NASA. And I'm, I'm, I'm at the highest levels at NASA. I decided to do the same thing where I ask everyone to leave. I did the pitch one more time. They said, you need to meet somebody. So that person flies out to San Diego. I go to another meeting. We get on a, uh, a conference call. And this person is a very important in the military. Can't say which branch, but the highest level of rank. And that person says, come fly and meet me up here in San Francisco within the next 48 hours. So I got on a plan and go there. And now I'm sitting on a, a NASA Ames. Um, NASA has three, three divisions. There's Ames Research, JPL, and then just NASA, the traditional NASA that everyone knows. 
I'm at Ames Research Center. Okay, so I actually think this is a good time to introduce the second person from that meeting in John Podesta's emails. In those emails, there's someone called Michael Carey. Now, this time, we don't have an email domain to go off like we did with Robert Weiss. Instead, Michael Carey is using a Gmail account, so we're going to have to do a little bit more detective work this time. But the good news is that you can still start to piece this together. In the interview, you can hear Tom say that this person he's just met with is someone of the highest level where you can count the stars on their shoulders. So run with me here. Let's just type General Michael Carey into Google. What do we get? All right, so we've got this guy here and he's got some credentials that seem pretty relevant. You know, Space Command, Air Force. This is all stuff about advanced stuff that's in the air that may be coming from somewhere else. But but still, you know, we're just working with a Google search, right? And I think if we're going to look into this subject, we want to make sure we have some credibility. So let's go a step further. Did you notice in that interview clip where Tom was talking, he said he went to San Francisco and he went to meet someone at NASA Ames. Okay, so whoever this person was, they clearly had some reason to be associated with NASA Ames. We can see by looking through the email chain that Tom had this experience, this meeting, this, this series of events at some point in the late summer and early fall of 2015. And what's interesting is at this point, General Michael Carey was actually no longer in the Air Force. He was now the CEO of a company called Microtech AAC, who were branching out into North America and who had just won a contract with NASA Ames. This meant that the headquarters of Microtech AAC in America was at the NASA Ames headquarters in San Francisco at exactly the date that Tom DeLong is referring to in the email chains that we can associate with the interview clips that we've just heard. So not only can we Google someone who's a general who seems relevant to the subject, but we can actually tie it down geographically and based on Michael Carey's career experience. So I think we can say with some reasonable certainty, I think we can reasonably put Michael Carey in the shoes of the person that Tom was referring to in the interview that we just heard and now i think is a good time to pass it back to tom delong nasa has three three divisions there's ames research jpl and then just nasa the traditional nasa that everyone knows i'm at ames research center and i go through my whole pitch again and this person um stops me and goes i just want you to know i'm a skeptic on this stuff and i said i understand that sir 20 minutes later i just want you to know i'm just i'm a skeptic and i go i know i know you are you already said that <laughs> you know and I, and I keep talking and by the time i got to to kind of concluding what this project would be he just staring at me and then he takes a deep breath and says introduce him to the general I, all of a sudden, on my email two hours later, I'm talking to somebody that has changed the entire course of this whole project. So I get on the phone with that person that same evening, and I go through the same situation. So I'm starting to t walk through what I'm trying to do and how, I'm, how I plan to do it. And this person goes, I want you to know I'm a skeptic on this stuff. And I go, sir, I knew you would say that, uh, but let me explain a little bit more. So I walk through it again, and then the, the person goes, I, uh, I just got to say it, I'm a skeptic. You know, <laughs> it, it was... It was verbatim they all do it but on the third time he goes I swore an oath to my country and I said sir I know you did I'm not asking for you to give me classified information I don't deserve it but I think if you understand what I'm about to do with this project you may think it deserves your attention and then he goes I'm afraid what you might find is a bunch of men in suits standing around an elephant and I said I was afraid you were gonna say that but can you help me and he says fly out and meet me Hey, well, good morning. It's, uh, it's wonderful to see so many here for uh, the morning class. Um, you know, I uh, uh, was warned that the, uh, the 8 o'clock hour might not see too many people uh, showing up, but uh, we're all engineers, and uh, I know that we all grew up uh, uh, going to early class and not waiting to noon like the uh, social sciences students. Uh, so, uh, it's a real treat for, for me to get to, uh, to try to outline for you uh, what we are doing in the Air Force Research Laboratory uh, and in our effort to create new choices uh, for our Air Force. Let's see if this is uh, advancing yet. Oh, it's on the side. There we are. I'm sorry. Aha. Aha. It's not behind me. Um, the, um, the exit criteria for, uh, for this area of research is uh, uh, is the opportunity for the Air Force to, to um, evolve the, uh, the sensing physics of its ISR platforms uh, with the inclusion of uh, uh, things like uh, LIDAR and passive multimode radar, uh, and to take the touch labor, uh, to reduce the touch labor, increase the operating efficiency 
of uh, intelligence analysts uh, in the field and, uh, uh, and in our uh, intelligence analyst centers. Now, that's somewhat awkward, and when I say this, by the way, I don't mean it in a derogatory way. Somewhat unimpressive man that you just saw on stage there is someone called General Neil McCasland. And we can say with 99.9% .9 certainty that that is the final person that Tom refers to in his story where he meets the general, this mysterious person who seems to have had deep and profound understanding and responsibility associated with this issue. Now, why can we say that? Well, in the email chain, you can see there's someone called Neil McCasland, and actually Tom refers to him as General Neil McCasland, with a bunch of other emails associated with him that are very interesting and definitely worth a read. Links in the description. So with that connection made pretty clearly, we've got to ask the question, who is this guy? Well, Neil McCasland has a PhD in aeronautical engineering that he got from MIT, whilst also working with the Air Force. Actually, he held multiple positions in the Air Force, in the NRO, and also in the Pentagon at multiple points in his career, rising up and up and up and up the food chain until he reached the rank of Major General, which, if you don't know, is very, very senior. But arguably, Neil McCaslin's career reached its absolute peak in 2011 to 2013, where he became commander of the Air Force Research Lab, which oversees 12,000 people with a budget of $2.2 billion, where he was basically responsible for the really advanced technical development that goes on for the Air Force. And that was located at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Now, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, huh? Has anyone ever heard of that place before? Well, if you're familiar with the world of ufology, if you're familiar with a lot of the stories and the tales and the anecdotes that have come down to us through multiple generations, then you'll have heard of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base before. This is the place where all of the mysterious UFO stuff seems to happen. So already, when you see General Neil McCaslin, this person's resume like sounds connected and related to this subject. But very often when people discuss Neil McCaslin, they stick at that point and they say, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, that's really interesting. That's the headline. And don't get me wrong, that is fascinating. But there is an unsung chapter to this man's career. Just before he was assigned to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Neil McCaslin took on a role at the Pentagon. During that role, he got a promotion, which led to him being Director of Special Programs for the Under Secretary of Defense for Logistics, Acquisition, and Technology. That role sounds kind of boring, and you would never look that person up and say, oh, wow, what a mysterious, interesting job role that must be connected to UFOs. But by default, the person who does that role becomes the Executive Secretary for the Special Access Programs Oversight Committee. So why does that matter? Well, Special Access Programs are the programs within the Department of Defense, well over 2,000 of them, that no one is supposed to know about. Right, it doesn't matter if you have a top secret clearance. Unless you have a need to know, you won't be read into that program. Very often, the operational budget, the research budget, the functioning budget that's doing the thing the Special Access Program is designed to do is completely neutered in comparison to the enormous security budget. That's because the fundamental requirement with these programs is that no one knows about them. And there's well over 2,000 of them in the United States. They're very expensive to run and they're extremely sensitive. And the whole idea is that only a very small number of people actually know about them, which means that the ultimate end goal is that nobody knows about all the programs or large groups of them. That would subvert the purpose of cutting them up and compartmentalizing them. So here you have someone who is responsible for the oversight committee of these SAPs. Not only responsible, but Neil McCasland was the executive secretary, which meant that he had a senior role and responsibility in overseeing these programs. So he was one of a tiny, tiny group of people who was given that level of access. So look, in a world where you're trying to work out if the reports of people talking about things they've seen in the air are really true, this is the guy you want to speak to. If you want to try and work out if somehow the United States government has really been covering this subject up for 70 years, this is the guy you would want to speak to. And somehow, this innocuous rock star who is fascinated by UFOs has managed to reach this person, not only to reach him, but to convince him to start having dialogue and conversations with him and to fly out and meet with him. Now, if you listen deeper into the interviews, and I will make videos about this later on, by the way, so if you're interested, subscribe to the channel and there'll be lots more content related to this story coming up in the future. If you listen to the interviews, Tom DeLong starts saying some astonishing, bizarre, strange, and disturbing stuff about the UFO phenomenon. The UFO phenomenon is interested in the bad things, and it brings along a lot of bad things. The way it's explained to me is that they are gods, 
the pain and, and the anger and the emotional energy of all the war is something that they're interested in. Humans organize around a priestly class. There's multiple different races. It's not just one specific kind. And the, the different races don't get along with each other. Genetic and biology play a major, major role in all of this. The entire UFO phenomenon is about multiple gods that fight amongst themselves and by design factionalize mankind into different religions to step back and let us fight each other so it has other things that it wants to accomplish. Traces its roots back to antiquity long before the ancient Greeks going back to Atlantis and beyond. What you have is something that doesn't like man period, and something that has some kind of plan for what man is to be. But it's not just one group, some that have been here forever, maybe long before we were. It has a tendency to stay in charge. I had one person tell me, extinct ancient civilizations are possibly evidence of those who did not obey. And then there's other groups that are outside of the solar system that are just bad news. To keep us from elevating our consciousness. Government is very aware that this intelligence is pitting different countries against each other based on religion. The UFO phenomenon has a hive mind. Some of the, the bodies that were retrieved in the back of the brain was a transmitter. They potentially don't have souls. And right when I sit down and I have a chance to bring this person on board, and he stops me and he goes, when I was a kid, I used to read a lot of Greek mythology. They feed off fear that Atlantis was real. Something was very important about that time frame and very important about who the humans were at that place. These things are zipping around and doing weird things with animals, doing weird things with people and abductions. They're off trying to accomplish something. And he claims that this information came to him from the general, from his advisors, from these people that he'd managed to make these connections with. And of course, at the time, he was able to share some of this stuff because no one knew who these people were. As far as the world was concerned, Tom DeLonge was just crazy. And so these crazy ideas were just a result of him and his wild imagination. But for now, with that aside, let's just summarize one more time, just so we're crystal clear on what it looks like has happened here with this series of events in 2015 and 2016. Tom DeLonge starts doing these interviews, talking about this stuff about meeting people and everyone just thinks he's crazy then the wikileaks breach happens which was completely unrelated to this whole stream of thought and logic but somehow revealed messages that showed that tom DeLong was in contact with john podesta was talking about a ufo project with john podesta and with his staff john podesta's internal staff were talking about a ufo project tom DeLong and john podesta had a series of emails talking about these two generals and eventually would meet with them and robert weiss who's the aerospace executive from lockheed martin skunk work in the emails afterwards, which I've not mentioned, there's follow-up, including Robert Weiss asking for an update from John Podesta following the meeting that had occurred. Clearly, something was in the works. Whether you believe UFOs are advanced technology from another civilization or a non-human intelligence, or whether you believe that actually it's all just secret advanced aerospace stuff from an organization like Skunk Works, some sort of planned communication was in the works to talk about this under a Hillary Clinton presidency. And there's a whole bunch of stuff around Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton and stuff about John Podesta that we're going to cover in a part two to this video. So again, subscribe for that if you're interested. But regardless, however much people like myself might have wanted that dialogue and conversation to have happened for things to have been said wikileaks threw a spanner in the works not only did it reveal the names of the secret advisors that no one was supposed to know about not only did it lift a lid on this entire plan and the strange communications associated with it but it also devastated hillary clinton's campaign because it exposed the corruption that was going on with things she was saying in her campaign versus things she was saying to her donors and to wall street and as a consequence it was one of many factors that led to hillary clinton losing and donald trump winning which meant whatever plan was in progress, it was stopped. Hillary Clinton was stopped. Donald Trump won. And all of this stuff that was going on in the emails and the conversations and the podcasts ultimately went dead. That wasn't quite the end of the story. In 2017, in the thick of the Trump presidency, Tom DeLonge came back. Gone were the secret advisors of the past, the people that Tom couldn't reveal their identities. And now you have a very public list of advisors who are staff in Tom DeLonge's new organization to the Stars Academy of Arts and Sciences. They had a public launch and not just a launch and a PowerPoint presentation, but they started to make 
Noise. Two of the key members to join the organization, Lua Lozondo and Christopher Mellon, who I'm sure you're familiar with, if not their names, then at least their faces, because they were all over the news in late 2017 and have been ever since talking about UFOs. Not only that, but they got the New York Times and Politico to run pieces talking about a secret UFO program buried deep within the Pentagon. And off the back of that and off the back of the conversations they started, they went into the House, they went into the Senate, and they started to get the United States government to start taking this seriously too. And in fact, if you've watched my video on Donald Trump and Chaim Ashed, you'll see that they managed to get Donald Trump thinking about it as well. But not only this, they also had plans to release products. They were building something called Scout AI, which is basically a large data platform that could absorb data about unidentified aerial phenomena and flight tracking data and all sorts of different data into an AI that can analyze it and start to make sense of the strange things that were being seen in the skies. And not only that, but they were also claiming they were going to create an advanced aerospace platform. Now, they had the right people on board in their organization to do this. Tom had managed to get someone called Steve Justice, who also had worked at the Skunk Works. In fact, his boss was Robert Weiss, who we talked about earlier. And he also had Hal Puttoff, who's famous in the world of the Pentagon and Department of Defense for his ideas in advanced propulsion and physics and all this kind of associated stuff. And they were saying they were going to start looking into building the sorts of technologies that people claim to have witnessed in the skies. Loads of noise, loads of news, loads of action, loads of publicity. And that was perfect. Not only because their primary objective was to push UFO disclosure forwards, but it also distracted from what had actually happened in 2016 and the strange emails and the strange mysterious people who were behind them. Quite convenient. And from there, UFO disclosure has never been the same again. Ultimately, we got the establishment of the UAP task Task Force, the Airborne Object Identification Management and Synchronization Group, Arrow, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, and now we've even got NASA talking about it too. And we've reached a point where we're actually being told that we don't know what these UAP are and that they constitute some sort of existential mystery. If you don't think the ball has moved down the field, then you've just not been watching the game, my friend. But... Whilst we've all been distracted by the amazing progress that's been going on, quietly, in the background, for some reason, the WikiLeaks emails that everyone had free access to have been removed. That email server is no longer publicly available. Now, you can still find them by using the Internet Archive. And when people do, they're often interested in the story about the general, you know, the famous emails talking about Roswell and Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and a lot of the things that we've covered. But there are other emails in that chain that I truly believe are more interesting. Very often, we forget the other person who was on that call. Very often, he eludes and escapes our analysis, and that is John Podesta. I mean, if you think about it, the questions are obvious. Why was this conversation happening in his inbox? Why was he facilitating this meeting? Why was he so interested in talking with Tom DeLong in the thick of the Hillary Clinton campaign? And why was Tom DeLong speaking so intensely about him in those interviews that we talked about earlier? So her campaign manager, John Podesta, is uh, a very, very powerful and important person. But you have to look at who he is. John Podesta is in my documentary uh, and my docu series. I think that he's, I think he's somebody that everybody needs to watch, to watch, to watch. That's all I'm gonna say. Pretty intense, right? What if I told you that the story was only just getting started? What if I told you there was a part two that is seldom ever told? What if I told you there was a secret plan underway, not just to take UFOs mainstream, but to brand John Podesta and to get young adults to like and to trust him so that he could become somebody that the youth can trust and rely on so that they can look to him in a leadership role that they can trust? This isn't just about UFOs. See, whilst all this stuff was going on about UFOs, there was also this project underway to lift John Podesta up as some kind of messiah on the subject. And Tom DeLong was integral in this and was explicit in his emails that this was exactly what he was trying to do for Podesta. Was that just something that Tom was doing to try and buttress his ego? Or maybe, in some sense, John Podesta was going to become crucial to this issue under a Hillary Clinton presidency. Or is it possible that Hillary didn't even know about this branding exercise, but that actually John Podesta had planned secretly and subversively to try and take center stage on this issue, to become the person who is going to tell the entire world the truth about UFOs? Imagine the ego rush if you thought you were going to be that person. Imagine the sense of entitlement and importance if you were going to be the person who goes down in history as standing up and saying, ladies and gentlemen of the world, it's true, it's real, we're not alone. When Podesta forwarded this email on to his longtime associate, assistant and friend, Jennifer Palmieri, he did so with just three unbelievably striking and perfect words. Our secret 
plan. What's even better is that when she received that email, she simply responded, Jesus. <laughs> and you know what? Come to think of it, that's actually about right. I think Jesus is a good comparison to exactly what they had in mind. I think it's time to open the books. Government investigations of UFOs. It's time to find out where the truth really is that's out there. And, and you know, there's a new name, unexplained aerial phenomenon. I think there's a lot of planets out there. Maybe yeah. the only way to unite this incredibly divided world of ours. They're out there. We better think of how all the differences among people on Earth would seem small if we felt threatened. I think we should continue to explore the boundaries of our existence, both into the Earth and beyond the skies. I think I've convinced her that we need an effort to declassify as much as we can. I would like us to go into those files and hopefully make as much of that public as possible. A lot of the things that happen, good and bad, will be stranger than anything ever written in science fiction. Hey guys, um, this is going to be the end of this video for now. There is a part two. I have planned the part two. A lot of it is already prepared, but I simply realized that this was already going to be such a mammoth project in and of itself. I hope you've really enjoyed this video. This has actually been months in the workings because I really wanted to go through and make sure I checked every single email, make notes. In fact, what I'm going to do right now as I'm saying this, I'm going to bring up my research document on the screen. I really want you guys to know when I talk about stuff, when I talk about this subject matter, um, I'm not just, you know, plucking stuff out of the air. I really pride myself on going deep, on looking into everything, on putting things in chronological order, finding references, cross-referencing conversations, podcasts, interviews, making sure that if I'm going to talk about patterns and themes, I actually have the data undergirding and underpinning that. If you have any questions or comments about everything that we've looked at, I would love to hear from you in the chat. If you're not a believer in this subject, I want to know, what does this story make you think? And if you are, if you're somebody who is deep in the world of ufology, I want to know, do you trust that this was a legitimate plan for disclosure? That's what we're going to be covering in part two. What were the motivations for the Clintons, for Podesta, and for all of these people. Do you think that this was a legitimate attempt to pull the UFO disclosure movement out and above into the open? And if you do, I want to know why do you think it was happening right here and then in that moment? Because clearly, these people were galvanized. Clearly, Tom had reached them at the right moment. So tell me your thoughts in the comments. My name's Jason Samosa. This has been Jason Samosa's Ufology Moment. And until next time, cheers.